Hey everybody, this is Chris back again and what I'd like to do today is I'd like to talk about the uh, introduction to the cell. So as we've talked about in class, uh, just to briefly recap the the organization of life, if you will, there are, there are several levels and we, we in anatomy and physiology, we take kind of an ab, ab initio approach where we start it at first principles or we start it at, very, at the very fundamental level and we work our way up to more or to additional levels of complexity and, and generally we, just to recap the, the most fundamental level of organizations going to be the, the chemical um, or the atomic level so um, atoms okay atoms or we'll say the chemical level and we know that atoms can combine to form molecules. All right. And then molecules, of course, can um, form even more complex molecules. And the, the major macromolecules of life, the proteins, the uh, carbohydrates, the nucleic acids, um, and uh, so on and so forth. Um, the proteins as well actually be the fourth one. And then finally, uh, the macromolecules um, can combine to form um, the functional unit of life known as the cell, the cellular level of organization. And then uh, multiple cells can combine to form tissues. All right, and then tissues, two or more tissues can uh, come together to form organs. I think these are multicellular, multi-tissue structures that perform certain jobs. Organs and then can form organ systems, such as the digestive system, which is a, uh, a large uh, system that contains many organs within it. Um, and then finally, all the organ systems combine to form the organism or the human human body in the case of human anatomy and physiology. So uh, we've already talked about atoms and chemicals in lecture. We've talked about molecules and so now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the cellular um, organization. And that's what we'll do here. Let me just go ahead and uh, get rid of all this stuff here. There we go. I'll need the space. And so what I have drawn here is a typical animal cell, which is what we will be talking about uh, primarily in human anatomy and physiology, um, is that animal cell. Okay, so I've drawn an animal cell here, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of take you through. Now, in animals, okay, so you basically have plants and animals okay, in biology, and um, you have general cell types. Um, <clears throat> you have uh, general cell types um, that plant and anim plants and animals can have, and the general cell types really come down to uh, two primary types. They come down to eukaryotic, eukaryotic, and pro- Karyotic, okay, and prokaryotic cells are not cells that we're really going to talk about in any detail in anatomy and physiology, but these are cells that do not have a well-defined nucleus. Um, their their genetic material just kind of floats around in the in the cytoplasm or within the, the cell itself. And prokaryotic cells, the the typical examples would be uh, things like bacteria. And archaea, um, though very, those kind of simple organisms um, would be examples of prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells are cells that actually, for the most part, have a well-defined nucleus. The nuclear material in the cell is contained within a nucleus, and that's what um, is characteristic of eukaryotic cells and um, the cells in the human body are 
um, animals specifically are eukaryotic. Again, we're not really going to talk about plants that much. So the type of cells that are in our body are these eukaryotic cells. And here I have an example of a eukaryotic cell right here. And let's just kind of talk about some of the, the components of the cell and we'll just start um, perhaps on the outer part and work our way in. So um, the, outer, the outer lining or covering of the cell okay, is something known as the cell membrane. Write it up here, the cell membrane or the plasma the plasma membrane. All right, the plasma membrane. And there we go. And so that forms the outer structure of this cell. And the the characteristic uh, structure, if we were to magnify that and looked at look at that, and remember we talked about the microscope. We really with uh, our typical, our standard light microscopes, uh, refracting light um, microscopes, we cannot really uh, resolve the cell membrane in any sort of detail because it's so small. But if, if, if we could uh, use other instruments, it, it would kind of have a characteristic um, bilayer appearance to it. And this is what's known as the phospholipid bilayer. And so what it's primarily consisted of uh, cons consists of a phosphorus group that is attached to two lipid tails, and that's called a phospholipid. The phosphorus is here and the lipid tails are here, and it's a bilayer. So you have these phospholipids, okay, and on the outside, and then you have phospholipids on the inside as well. And the reason that that happens is the phosphorus part of this, the phosphorus part is, is polar. Okay, it's polar, so it's more charged. And so it is more hydrophilic. It likes water more, okay? And so these are going to be attracted to the water, the water in the, aque the aqueous or water-like environment that surrounds the cell. And it's also going to be the, the phos phosphorus groups are going to be attracted to the water that's inside of the t cell, whereas these lipids here, all right, these lipids are generally nonpolar for the most part, and these tend to be more hydrophobic. They are water-fearing, or they are lipophilic, lipid-loving. Um, so they're going to be attracted to themselves, and they're going to be um, trying to get away from the water, and so they'll be in the center. So you have this phospholipid bilayer, like that. And um, embedded in that phospholipid bilayer, you can have different proteins. And so you can have proteins that can embed in that layer, and these proteins may act as channels that can allow stuff to get into or may even uh, pump stuff out of the cells. Okay, um, So you can have these protein channels. These proteins may even be receptors as well. Um, they may react um, to stimuli or other chemicals in the, uh, is within or outside of the cell. Okay, so these can be channels or pumps. They can be receptors. Um, you can also have um, proteins that are kind of embedded in this cell and that have structure that goes outside of the cell. And these may be involved in um, cell signaling and identifying self from non-self. So they may, they may be a, a, an important part of... Uh, the immune response or the immune system, for example. They may be an important part of anchoring the cell, kind of holding the cell down and, and anchoring it in place. So you can have these proteins, you can have these proteins embedded in the, the phospholipid bilayer, and they may have like carbohydrate groups, and we call those glycoproteins. Um, and then you have also within the middle of the cell, you have 
cholesterol. And cholesterol is kind of slippery and, and, and fluidy, if you will. It's not really a, a proper term, but it's kind of slippery and slick in it. And it gives the membrane a kind of a more flexible, fluid kind of characteristic. So it can, it can flex around and, and it's not rigid. Uh, for the most part. So cholesterol is an important part of, of the, the phospholipid um, layer. And the cell membrane or the plasma membrane is very selective, okay, about what it can allow to get in or out of the cell, okay. And stuff, when we talk about getting stuff through this cell membrane, we often use a word known as permeability. permeability. If, if it is permeable to something, that means that, that, that whatever it is can get through. And we say that the, the cell membrane is selectively, it is selective in its permeability. Okay, it's selectively permeable or it's selective in what it can allow to get in and out, can go through it. <clears throat> and we'll talk about what how stuff gets in and out in, in a little more detail. Okay, so there you go with the cell membrane. Now, some cells may also have some, some projections that come out of them, and a couple of the projections that you can get is you can get these, these shorter, kind of, kind of larger projections that look like little, little fingers, and, and, and these are called microvilli. Microvilli. Okay, and these microvilli uh, may be able to do a lot of different things. They may help anchor the cell to other cells. Um, oftentimes, um, the major function of the microvilli, uh, really, and, and, and really where you'll see these more often, this structure more often than not, is in the intestines, is it increases, it increases the surface area, increases the surface area of the cell, and that allows this additional area for stuff to get into the cell, to be absorbed into the cell, and that's why you see these microvilli more, these are much more common in the intestinal tract, in the intestines, where you're absorbing lots of nutrients, you're absorbing water. Um, and so that's where you often see microvilli. And these microvilli um, <clears throat> may, 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 may be supported by uh, some structures within the cell, and I'll talk about them here in just a little bit. Um, some other structures that some cells have, not all cells, again, not all cells have mi microvilli as well, but some cells do. Um, they have a long, slender structure that can move around, kind of in a whip-like motion, and these structures are known as cilia. And these cilia actually have this structure called a microtubule. A microtubule. Um, and these microtubules are attached to little motor proteins, um, uh, proteins that, are, that can actually move these, these, these little microtubules, these little tubes. And that's actually what causes this whip-like motion of the cilia. And so these cilia can actually whip and move around. Um, now, we often see cilia in, in a specific area of the body. So we see microvilli in the, in the intestines Cilia are typically found in the lining of the airways of our respiratory system. And the, the reason we see that is these cilia can beat and they can move what, what's known as a mucus blanket. And that mucus blanket lines your throat and your, in, the, in your lower airways and your lungs. And it, <clears throat> what it does is it um, can trap um, toxins and dust and uh, dander and... Um, and anything that might be a problem, and it kind of is like it's kind of like a sticky. It's very sticky. It traps that stuff, and then the cilia beat, and they move that mucus to your upper airway, where you can either cough that stuff up, 
or you can expect or you can expectorate, cough it up, or you can you can swallow it. Um, so cilia are very common in the GI tract. Now, um, some cells um, have a very um, uh, so the cilia aren't particularly long, but you some cells will have a very very long single uh, cilia-like structure. Okay, it's very long. And in this case, we don't call that cilia, we call that a flagellum or flagella if we're talking about multiple. And flagella are, again, not every cell has these, but flagella are most common in sperm, in the human body at least. And um, this is not for um, moving mucus blankets around in your airways, but this is actually for locomotion. This is actually used for movement. Its structure is very similar to cilia, um, but it's, it's very long. It has this microtubule motor proteins run it as well. Um, <clears throat> and flagella and cilia, if you were to cut this, um, what you would see is a very characteristic structure, and this is uh, this microtubule structure, and this is often known as a 9 plus 2 structure, where you have these, um, these very small tubules kind of wrapped up in a circle. So you have these um, 9 microtubules. See if I can draw them. Like this these nine microtubules surrounding two larger central tubules and then that makes up the entire uh, tubular structure that you're looking at this nine plus two so if you hear that that's what that is um, talking about okay so let's go ahead and move our way into some other structures of the cell um, so in the center of the cell or, or in the center ish of the cell you have this round membrane uh, structure here and this is known as the nucleus of the cell and the nucleus of the cell is surrounded by a nuclear membrane and that nuclear membrane has little pores in it and those little pores allow stuff to get in and out of the nucleus and the nucleus contains the blueprint, okay, think of it as a blueprint, um, the genetic material, the DNA, the deoxyribonucleic acid, the DNA blueprint of the cell. And that DNA is copied, okay, so the DNA stays safe, uh, safe inside of the nucleus for the most part. And what happens is if stuff needs to be, proteins need to be produced, that DNA is copied into RNA, okay, specifically it's copied into what we call mRNA or messenger RNA. And then the RNA leaves the nucleus, okay, it leaves the nucleus through the pores and it goes into this little dotted, this kind of this little dotted highway-like structure here. And you can see those little blue dots on that structure. And this structure here, I just think of it as kind of a highway, okay? And the RNA, so the, the DNA is copied into to messenger RNA, and then the messenger RNA, okay? So DNA is turned into mRNA in the nucleus. And then the RNA leaves, and it takes a ride on this structure with all these little dots and this structure with all these little dots is known as the rough okay because it has a rough appearance the rough endo plasmic endoplasmic reticulum Okay, or the rough ER. And what happens here in the rough ER is the character, classic or characteristic structure on that rough endoplasmic reticulum okay, is known as a ribosome. 
Okay, and that's what these little blue dots are. And these ribosomes uh, read, okay, they quote unquote read, they read the mRNA, okay, the mRNA comes into the ribosome, the ribosome reads it, and that, that RNA tells the ribosome how to make proteins. And so the major thing that occurs in the rough endoplasmic reticulum is protein synthesis. Okay, proteins are synthesized, so the amino acids um, are turned into polypeptides when they're combined, and then polypeptides eventually become proteins. Now, you also do have some ribosomes that exist just floating around in this area, just floating around, uh, not attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. And this environment here, the, the, the environment within the cell that these little structures exist in, and these little structures are, are generally the nucleus and the endoplasmic reticulum and some of this other stuff, these structures are collectively called organelles. And the matrix or the environment that this stuff floats around in is known as the cytoplasm. Again, remember cytology is a study of cells, so the plasm of the cell. Okay. And if we're just talking about the fluid part of the cytoplasm without all the organelles, just the fluid, just the fluid itself, that's known as cytosol. Cytosol. Okay, cytosol is just the fluid or the liquid part. The cytoplasm is a liquid plus all the organelles. Okay, all right. <clears throat> so you have ribosomes that can um, manufacture protein within the cytoplasm itself, but most of the, um, the ribosomes are attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. All right. Now, in the very center of the nucleus, you have this round structure here it, that is not, it, it's, it's a material, but it is not covered in an envelope like the nucleus. Um, and this structure at the very center of the cell here, all right, the very center is some, something known as the nucleolus, not the nucleus, but the nucleolus. The nucleolus. And the nucleolus is where a special kind of RNA, not messenger RNA, but R RNA is produced, and that is called ribosomal RNA. And so ribosomes are produced as a result of that. So ribosomes come from RNA that comes from the nucleolus, and then all the other proteins come from the DNA that is copied into the messenger RNA. That is then um, that then tells the ribosomes how to produce the proteins. All right. Now we also have another type of endoplasmic reticulum that does not have ribosomes, and so it has a smooth structure to it, and we call that the smooth endoplasmic reticulum or the smooth ER. Okay. The big thing that happens here is um, not so much synthesis of um, proteins, but lipid, lipid and carbohydrate synthesis is uh, very commonly uh, occurring here in this smooth um, endoplasmic reticulum. And a very important thing in this, I don't think this is specifically mentioned in your textbook, but it is important is this is where you have enzymes, okay, enzymes that can help detoxify, detoxify substances. And in fact, this is where in your liver cells, specifically most of the drugs, if you take a drug and a medication, um, most of the drugs are actually metabolized by enzymes in the smooth ER, and there are a specific 
a large specific group of enzymes known as the cytochrome P450 or the CYP enzymes. The cytochrome P450, you don't have to know that in any detail, but these enzymes are very, very important when it comes to metabolizing drugs. They actually add oxygen to drugs to make the drugs more, more polar so the body can eliminate them easier. And certain ions can be stored within the smooth ER, such as uh, sodium um, would be an example of an ion that can be stored. So a lot of really important stuff going on here in the um, smooth endoplasmic reticulum as well. Okie dokie, let's move right along. Um, so we have this this kind of this stacked up structure here. We kind of have this kind of this stacking going on, these, these little membranous layers here. Um, and these individual layers are what we call Golgi. I'm kind of running out of space, but let me write it over here. Golgi. Golgi bodies. All right. And uh, draw a line behind that. There we go, Golgi bodies, all right? And the whole thing is sometimes referred to as a Golgi apparatus. And the, the, what happens here is proteins that are produced, and maybe I'll draw this in another color. So proteins that are produced in the rough endoplasmic reticulum are then packaged, okay? Think of this as a packaging plant, if you will, or perhaps like a post office. Um, so the proteins, that were produced in the rough endoplasmic reticulum, okay, um, are packaged, and and they are packaged. Um, proteins are packaged, okay, and then they're sent out to where they need to go. They're packaged and they're sent out. That's a major thing that happens in the Golgi um, apparatus, the Golgi bodies. Okie dokie. Um, there are some other things that can uh, go on in the uh, Golgi apparatus as well. Um, some proteins are actually turned into hormones, so you have some hormone production that occurs in it, specifically protein-based hormones. Okay, um, or um, Proteins might be combined with other molecules, such as carbohydrates, and so you can produce like glycoproteins. So, carbs, carbohydrates, and proteins are combined. So, you, so things like glycoproteins are made. Okay, and then eventually that stuff is packaged. Okay, it's packaged into these little little, the proteins themselves are packaged into these little circular structures here. Okay, these little circular structures, and these are known as vesicles. All right, and then the vesicles can move around to where they need to go. They can transport that protein to where they need to go. Now, there are specialized vesicle-like structures that I want to talk about, okay? Um, one type, and that's this little structure that has these little red dots inside of it. Okay, these structures are what we call um, lysosomes. Lysosomes. And lysosomes contain digestive enzymes. Okay, they contain digestive enzymes. All right. And these enzymes may be helpful in, in removing damaged organelles or removing or digesting things that need to go away within the cell. And then you also have something very similar to a lysosome, okay, and that has these little green dots here. And these are known as peroxisomes. Peroxisomes. And um, peroxisomes contain enzymes. They're similar to lysosomes, but they contain enzymes that degrade. All right, enzymes that are designed to degrade or break down. Okay, 
Specifically, these are very important when it comes to neutralizing neutralizing or killing invaders. Okay, so viruses and bacteria and certain types of immune cells or white blood cells have lots of these peroxisomes and lys lysosomes as well. And they can uh, use those. Those can travel. Sometimes the, bacteri the bacteria will be engulfed within the cell itself. And then these lysosomes are dumped into that bacteria and they, they break it up, digest it, kill it. Okie dokie. Um, so just a couple more structures and, and we'll be done. This structure here, it looks kind of like a kidney bean and has a double membrane-like um, structure, is known as a mitochondria. Mito mitochondria, my computer's kind of slowing down a little bit there. Um, and so it's getting a little choppy here. So that's a mitochondria. And the mitochondria, the big thing that you want to know about the mitochondria is that's where approximately 95% of all the ATP, the adenosine triphosphate, or the energy, nine, about 95% of the energy for the cell is produced in the mitochondria. And interestingly enough, mitochondria appears, when we look at the evolutionary biology of, of mitochondria, mitochondria at one, one point in time, millions and uh, millions and millions of years ago, were probably some sort of bacteria that um, kind of got engulfed by a cell and then there was this what we call a symbiotic relationship that, that resulted where instead of destroying the bacteria, the bacteria was able to produce all this energy for the cell and so the cell went, oh, okay, well, I won't kill you. And uh, from that point on, it, it, it became an organelle and, and, and we actually know this because mitochondria have contained their own separate genetic material, um, their, their, their own RNA. Um, and we can actually trace a certain human uh, humans. We can trace their lineage um, through, their, um, through the, the mother, I believe, actually, um, through the, the mitochondrial, the, uh, yeah, mitochondrial uh, genetic material. So just kind of some fascinating um, information on the side. Okay, we also have these these cylindrical cylindrical types of structures that ha actually have uh, like a nine 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 tubes that kind of form in a cylinder, and you have two of them, and these are are really only important when it comes to cell division. And I'm gonna have to make an entire video just talking about um, cell division on its own. But these specific structures are known as the centrioles. Okay, centrioles. And when the centrioles are together in, in this in, in, in the in the when they're when they're together and the cell's not dividing, that whole structure is known as the centrosome. And the centrioles, again, are really only important when it comes to cell division. And we'll talk about that in more detail in subsequent videos. Whew, almost there. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about is I want to talk about um, the, these, these fiber-like structures. So you get these little fibers, this fibrous-like structure um, that exists within the cytoplasm. And this is something known as the cytocell skeleton. And these are fibers that um, kind of provide strength and structural support. And some cells have more of the uh, more robust cytoskeleton, and other cells don't need as much of one, and so it just kind of varies um, depending on the specific cell type that we're talking about. At this point in time, we're just talking about a generic cell. Okay, guys, so I've taken you through the introduction to the cell and the major organelles, and uh, there will be other videos talking about some of the more nuanced information when it comes to cytology. All right, thanks for hanging in there.